Hello and welcome back to the Color of Money podcast. Today I'm joined by one of my favorite people in this entire world, Mr. Emmerich Peace. Good to see you, Unc. Hey, what's going on, bro? And today we're gonna have we're gonna have an honest conversation around what's happening in our world. What did we do the first six months of this of this year? And what's gonna change the next second half of this year? We have a change in landscape in our industry right now. And we're gonna have an honest conversation around how do you win? How do you build your investment portfolio? How do you sell houses? How do you just reflect and grow the second half of 2024? So Emmerich, what do you what, what are you seeing in your market? So you run one of the biggest market centers in the country and you see agents having um, successes and challenges kind of all over the place. What have you seen change in this landscape? And what, what do you think we go from here? You know, that book, Who Moved the Cheese? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the cheese has moved. The cheese has moved. The cheese has moved. And we're going back to that same spot. And the reality is that uh, it's going to take a new person. You know, and my, my, my real question has been, you know, who are you willing to become to reinvent yourself for this new business landscape? And what I'm really seeing is just really, it's, it's, it's kind of sort of a back to the basics, something that you might not understand uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we had to do some things. We had to really get belly to belly, face to face. We had to have yeah. a lot more conversations. Uh, we had to we had to be purposeful in our, in our relationships because we're competing against so many other entities. We're competing against the internet leads. We're competing against the internet. We're competing against people's friends. We're competing against just- Interest rates. Interest rates. Institutional investors, all of them. <laughs> Look, we're competing against lack of inventory. You know, in, my, in, in our area in general, they say like, we like almost, 20,000 listings short of where we normally would be. That's a different conversation. It's going to take a different person to persevere and to excel in this marketplace. And like I said, it's coming back to the, like 15, 20 years ago business where it's a lot of hand holding, not really hand holding, it's a lot of personal interaction to build relationships where people have gotten adjusted to having internet relationships, Facebook relationships. Uh, Instagram relationships. And I'm not saying you can't initially connect with people with those relationships. However, there has to be an emotional sticky yeah. in where we're going right now, because, you know, they, so many things are emotion based right now. We, we, we have to do something different. And it's just, again, back to basics. It's like fundamental. It's like basketball. It's like football, any sport. If you're a basketball player, the fundamental says, no matter how good of a player you are, right that you slide your feet on defense and you square up on offense yeah that's it i mean those are the fundamentals and it's the same way i'm thinking about from real estate uh, you're going to have to have personal connections to attract people and you have going to have to connect with them more frequently to bring them into your space yeah the the math has changed how many times you need to be creating value for your clients for them and talk about real estate. You know, I think it's fascinating just being able to see, I mean, being in market center ownership, you get to see and hear a lot of things. You get to see all the results right. from all the agents, who's winning, who's losing, who's up year over year, who's down. And I think one of the most fascinating things, even with some investors that we're working with is just like, are you willing to do more work to get the same results that you had in the past? And that's the scary oh. part. Are you willing to do more work? And I think it's the the ones that accept it and understand it are the ones that are that are thriving right now. There's a lot of agents that I know that are crushing it right now. Yeah, and 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 again, it comes back to that point of being fundamentally sound. Yeah, it comes back to that point of being fundamentally sound. I've got a couple people that you know they're really in that space of that three hours a day of lead generation. They're really in that space and their businesses are taking off. They're into that high touch mode, that yeah. personal touch mode, that emotional sticky. Because at, at the end of the day, anybody can go to the internet and pull something up and, 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 and pull something off the computer. The question is when they pull it up, are they gonna call you? Or are they gonna call 
that remote person that has no relationship with them. They just want to get what they get. And that's where we really have to form better relationships because people can get whatever they want without calling us. Yeah, We are no longer a necessity. And so you have to have that emotional sticky. So when they have that urge to call somebody else for something else, they're going to call you. Well, how do you do that? How do you, you mentioned a few times, build, build better relationships in the society that we're in today. I think the relationships and interpersonal communication has completely dipped. So like, how do you just some fundamentals on how do you build good relationships with clients and other agents for that matter? Well, it's the whole conversation. Well, and I believe that a lot of, in a lot of places we've gotten consumed with the word I in our dialogue. Mm-hmm instead of saying you. When I say you, if I say Daniel, what I'd like to do for you is I'd like to sit down and talk to you so I can understand what's going on in your world so I can best help you. Mm -hmm. I said you four times. Now your response to me would be what? This person is interested in me. He cares. And so in that place of emotional sticky, we have to begin to change our dialogue so that there's no I in our dialogue. There's a you and your in the dialogue. Yeah. I think a, a hack with that too. I, I, I say we a lot. Right. When I'm talking with someone, we're going to do this or so we can mm-hmm. find out what you're qualified for or whatnot. So I think the other thing, when you think about building relationships with people, it's using their name. It's yes. simple. It's having conversations and, and trying to get three, four times where I say your name, Emmerich. It just, it hits different. Well, here's the deal. You know, what's the sweetest word that anyone likes to hear? <laughs> Their name, for exactly. sure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The other thing uh, that we have to be really clear about, and, if, and that emotional stick is, we have to have better listening skills. Two ears and one mouth, right? Use them proportionally. <laughs> and, and so better listening skills, a lot of times, and again, that's fundamental, where we're not having a direct dialogue with the people who we're wishing to engage or we're wishing to help. The dialogue is about how can I get to my end goal as a person instead of listening to what their motivations are, what their expectations are, and then what direction they want to travel. I believe that like a lot of times in that, in that whole internet age, one of the things that, we we started to latch on to is I'm the professional and I'm going to tell you where you have to go and where I'm going to take you to get what you want to get because it's going to help me spend less time with you. Right. So my objective is to spend, is to help as many clients as possible and as little time as possible and there's no relationship in that space. Well, I think so many people don't go two, three, four levels deep mm. on simple questions. Mm. What part of town do you want to live in? And then go three, four layers from there to really understand who is this person and what do they want exactly? I know you want a house in this area. I get it. But tell me more about the situation. Right. And and that, again, that's coming back to fundamentals. You know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we had to ask those questions because the Internet was not uh, was not our best friend. We couldn't we couldn't do research to get as much information as we can get right now. And as it sits right now, hell, you can put something in chat GPT and get all the answers. <laughs> and they translate too. It's wild. Exactly. <laughs> and so in that space, that again, that emotional sticky, that personal contact, that's what it's gonna take to move further. You know, whatever you didn't do in the past six months, in the past year, that's what you're gonna have to do moving forward. The other thing with that though, you know, um, when we talk, when we had that conversation, we got to have a conversation about inventory, just the amount of houses on the market and the whole idea of what are we going to do different? How are we going to get more business? Well, it's both things are shrinking. Inventory shrinking or has shrunk and right. transaction count shrinking. Mm-hmm. We over the last 10 years, Denver's seen we sell about 36 to 38 thousand single family homes a year. And last year, we're about 24,000. This year, we're supposed to be somewhere between 23 to 25,000. We're talking about 12,000 units pulled 30% of our transactions. 30%, yeah. And the crazy part about that 12,000 less transactions, every transaction, there's two closing checks. Yeah. (laughs) So you're really talking about 24,000 agents paid in a year. Like, how are you going to get that back? 
And so there's a lot of this is a good transition to talk about inventory and like the the market in a sense. Like, what do you think needs to change on how agents perceive listings or inventory? What are you seeing in your world? We are seeing about a 35 percent decrease in transaction count. And the other thing that we're seeing is that uh, the the disparity or the disbursement of the business is changing. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The people that are doing the business are doing more business. The people who aren't doing business are doing less business. Yeah. And, and that's real because, and that's part of it is because, again, we've been talking about this for a long time, being in a skill-based market. When you your skill set is going to be critical in this place. And so what that's going to require, that's going to require more of us to go to places where we can get better educated, uh, to have better conversations with our customers and clients and to be and to be more knowledgeable in the marketplace. And that's not something that we've had to do in the past, you know, 10 years almost. Yeah, I was going to say eight to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, anybody, you know, you want to buy a house? Sure. Anybody can sell a house. And just a lot of times uh, a lot of people were saying, oh, uh, some of my clients, they got their real estate license because I inspired them and they want to be a real estate agent. That ain't really the case. But a lot of times what they were saying is if you're dumb behind can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We're seeing we're seeing people leave every every single week that are mm-hmm. inactivating their license and, you know, going on to the other thing that they decided to do. It's expensive Uber. to be in real estate. Yeah. Uber. Uber, Uber, Lyft. Yeah. Big time. Big time. And so when when we're having this conversation, what what do they have to do from your perspective? What does an agent have to do to grow their business or to get more business in this at this particular point in time? 2024, uh, June and beyond. What are they going to have to do to get more business? I think that you got to understand your math and realize that it's going to take more effort. Okay, well, what does more effort mean exactly? That mm-hmm. means more open houses. That means more conversations. That means more I care calls. That means more handwritten letters. That means more Facebook DMs. That means more of everything you need to do to hopefully make the same amount of money that you made before. The wild part is when we when we look back over the last like three years, a lot of agents have made more money and have not had to work very hard. And now the transition is we're working really, really hard and we're making less money. Yes. And, and you know, <laughs> that was one of the things I had a conversation uh, a couple of days ago and I was talking about an agent that not a particular agent, agents in general that five, six years ago, they were selling $6 million in real estate. Fast forward to 2023, and they still sold six million dollars in real estate, and they believe that they're still doing the same thing that they did before. Their bills are being paid, their mortgage are being paid, so they're looking at the volume and they're saying, "Well, I'm in the same place. I'm doing as good as I was six years ago," and that's not true. Prices have gone up thirty, almost forty percent, right? So that means that a two hundred thousand dollar house. Is now two eighty. Yeah, you sold six million dollars in real estate, so now you really did fifteen. You did four, 15 transactions, right? Where before you were doing twenty transactions. Right. So if you would did those same twenty transactions at at uh, at today's prices, right. Right. your business works. right. You'd be up, you'd be up 30 percent. And that's one thing that we have to take a look at. We have to look at that really, really carefully. And we have to educate agents to start looking at transactions or units and not volume. Yeah, because we're getting we're getting tricked by the volume right now. Well, because the volume controls our paychecks. So the volume stays the same. Then my income stays the same. But you realize that in a shrinking world, you're also shrinking. Yes. And so now what is worse than not being able to hit your full potential? That's what I constantly think about, man. Like whenever right. I want to quit, like could my life be a lot easier and more le- and less stress? Like yeah. Yeah, I could get some get some of these black hairs back. <laughs> you know, get my afro back back picked again. I did notice uh your beard is looking a little more mature than it has in the past. I'm catching you, Uncle. <laughs> it's happening fast. <laughs> and again, that that just creates a different stress point for a lot of folks and that idea that 
they're stuck in the volume number and not the transaction number. Yeah. Right. Because what and this is unfortunate in our industry. What's happened is that most most agents produce to the level of their bills and their ability to go on vacation. Most agents, if they can pay their bills and go on vacation once a year, they're happy. Happy. And even if that, that vacation happens to be a family reunion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they're whole. It's crazy because, you know, when we start talking about where we are right now and doing the same thing, doing the same thing is going to get you actually less results. We used to say doing the same thing is going to get you the same results. No, that's not true. Doing the same thing is going to get you less results in this climate of which we have to do business. Yeah, and I think where, how do you understand the market? I think that's one of the things that are changing too and mm -hmm. communicating to sellers, like what your home is worth is not what a buyer is willing to pay for it in today's world. Right. It's crazy, and so we've gotta do an evaluation on it. This is where I think your home is worth, and here's where I think we should probably price it to appeal to the to the consumers still because the old, the old days of your home is worth X and they pay over that and you win, and we're, in a different, we're in a different world now where now they're paying under. And here's the deal. That's because uh, they've been conditioned to think about a 4% four, a 4 interest rate. Yeah. Well, the reality is you're getting a 6% interest rate, which means your payment's going to go up about 900 to $1,000. Easy. So now your payment is up $1,000, but sometimes even $2,000. Mm -hmm. I'm not willing to pay that price for a $4,000 mortgage. I know. If I can get my payment down to $3,500, maybe $3,200, I'll be happy. I can do that. I cannot do a $4,000 mortgage. Yeah. And that's the question. That's the it conversation. Is. It is, and I think as agents, as real estate professionals, communicating with your clients and letting them know some of the, the tricks of the trade, like how do we get a 4% rate? Well, we can do a 2-1 buy-down. Right. We can do a permanent buy-down. We can, I'm consulting a lot, of my, a lot of my clients I'm working with on the mortgage side right now. I, of course, I don't know that interest rates are gonna go down, but the thought of spending more money to buy down an interest rate today, that might be that rate in six months, just seems not, like, not very smart to me. Right. So I'm almost like just be where you're at now, reduce the amount of cash to close that you have now, and we'll deal with your financing over the next 12 to 24 months. And that's a great point. And, but, and the idea of that is, again, the educated agent. Yeah. A skill-based yeah. market. That's a skillful conversation. That is a skillful conversation. And by the way, 15, 20 years ago, we had to have that conversation <laughs> just to be clear. And so the conversation is coming back is again, it's back to fundamentals. The other thing, like when you're having that conversation and about people's skill building, most agents don't know and understand financing. Correct. The word that they used to say was, I'm not the loan officer. Let me <laughs> let you talk to the loan officer and they can give you all of that information. Yeah. Well, if you don't have any emotional, any emotional sticky, they're not calling the loan officer. They're going to call another agent. Oh, 100 percent. We're actually we're in the process of getting some of our agents licensed in, in the wake of the of the lawsuit. OK. And helping you understand the full scope of being able to service your clients. If agents understood about discount points and closing costs and fees and taxes on new builds and um, two one buy downs and like all some of the intricate details, they can save their client literally tens of thousands of dollars. Wow. Literally. Wow. It's funny. Real estate agents are, and, and lenders are like oil and water. Yes. They just don't mix. Ah, that's not my side of the fence. I don't understand that. <laughs> Which is really a position of ignorance, to be honest with you. Because that is your side of the fence. When you have a client and you're servicing your client and you're, you are a fiduciary to your client and your client asks you a finance question, you should know basic general finance. I didn't say you have to know how to process a loan. Right. You should be able to support them to ask the best questions to get them in the best direction because here's what happens. What we as uh, real estate professionals do all the time is we refer them to a loan officer so how do we know that we're referring them to the best place? If we're fiduciary, we have to understand and know that we're referring them 
to the best place to get a loan. Because at the end of the day, you know, you can do all the work as a real estate professional. You can do go through a home inspection. You can find a house. You can go through all the negotiations. However, if the loan officer can't get them a loan, all your work is for naught. If you think about a real estate agent, they understand his title. Mm-hmm. They get it. They, they can review a title commitment and understand how to communicate effectively. But you put a closing disclosure in front of them and they just kind of freeze. <laughs> I don't know. How, I don't know what this means exactly. What are all these fees? I don't know. How does one invest now? I still think it's housing. I still think it's houses. A lot of what me and my family are doing is we're moving our money out of single family investing. We're still flipping and doing some of that stuff, but we're focusing more on more on the cash flow game, more, more on multifamily. Okay. I think with the amount of people who need housing and as unaffordable as it is to buy a house, our entry level house here for the most part is a three thousand dollar payment. Okay. With a minimum down payment. Like that's that's crazy. Right. That's a crazy high monthly payment for your entry level buyer. But I think you're always gonna need those rentals. People who need a place to stay and in a rising rate environment, I think it's a pretty safe get, safe place to stay. And think about the cash flow game. I've been playing the net worth game for the last few years. And so as things pivot, the cash flow gets tight and things start getting kind of crazy. Okay. And so now this next this next go round, it's really only investing in cash flowing assets that allow you to get out of the rat race, that allow you to get out of the the day to day. All of my life expenses are paid for by these investments. I believe that it's still twofold. It is the cash flow game and it is the uh, net worth game at the same time. It's just a slower net worth game. Slower net worth game. I was lucky enough last week to spend some time with Gary Keller. And one of the things that he he blew my mind, he goes, Daniel, I, I don't. I don't ever necessarily want to be the richest person on the planet. I want to I want to be able to sleep the best. And so we were talking about leverage and we we're talking about over leveraging your assets and reducing cash flow to go grow more net worth and buy more things or play the longer game of paying off assets, increasing the cash flow. And then those assets will continue to grow over time as well. And so his his communication around downturns and chaos, as you know, Gary's seen everything and around downturns is if you're cash flowing on these assets and the downturn happens, there's not a lot that necessarily happens to you. If you're over leveraged and you deal with a downturn, you're going to get destroyed. And so it changed my mind about thinking about money and how I think about money and how we think about the cash flow game we're working to play. And, and I don't know, it's exciting thinking about that and thinking about anything that we can buy that can create cash flow for us, how we can hack the, the, the home ownership, game by if we don't have 20 percent to put down an investment property how else can we get it what else can we do to be able to attain home ownership and then continue to grow that that portfolio well you know it was uh, i was in a session in austin myself last week and something came up it was just crazy and it said less than 15 percent of real estate professionals own investment properties wild (laughs) <laughs> that is crazy. So that comes back to this question that I've been saying for a long time. Are you buying what you're selling? Yeah. Are you buying what you're selling? If home ownership or 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 property ownership is so special, why don't you own property? Yeah. Or and, learn, like like do your first flip or be along with one of your investors that flip and pick their brain on how do they evaluate it. I have a friend of mine that's getting ready to do their first flip and he's terrified. He's been an agent for like 15 years. Wow. And he's terrified. And I'm like, I got you. We'll go through this together. But (laughs) we should have done more than one up until this part of his career. This is hypothetical speaking. We are not speaking commissions. We're not speaking commissions. We're going to talk bananas. This is just bananas. bananas. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Okay. If you buy 200,000 bananas, right, and you collect a certain amount offered 200,000 bananas. And let's just say you make $8,000 off of 200,000 bananas. The person that you sold the bananas to is gonna sell the bananas for (laughs) $400,000. Right. And they're gonna make $200,000 minus what they paid the workers to pick the bananas, which was $100,000. So they actually make $100,000 off the bananas yeah. Right. That you only made six thousand dollars off of. 
Well, it's, it's changing your mindset though, Emmerich. It's, it's thinking about how can I go flip it first? Like you're excited to get this to your investor. If you can just get the listing once it's flipped. Right. And if he gives you the listing, like, man, you'll find every deal in the city for him. Come on. Come on. That's the banana in the tailpipe. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's the banana in the tailpipe. But and, and we're doing it. And for me, like in my career, I've never liked working with the investors because, you know, even if you are working with investors, investors are not emotionally attached to the outcome. Yeah. So what may be a good deal for them today based on their cost of money may not be a good thing for them tomorrow. Right. So you could have done all of that work, working with the work, uh, helping and invest in the numbers don't work for him three months, three weeks into the deal, a month into the deal. I believe that, you know, once you do your work, you're supposed to get paid. And you can't always say that with an investor. That's yeah. that in. That's fair. But more importantly, we really have to start taking a look at who can. And here's another challenge that most of us won't take the deal because we say we don't have the money. The real question is, who can I partner with to make this deal work? Right. And we have to just the same way we have a list of investors as real estate professionals, we're going to have to start getting a list of partners. Yeah. Again, another another thing Gary said is everything inside of his life, he has partners. He's partners with everything. The brokerage, the investor, the investments he has, the right. stuff he owns, his partnership with everybody with it. And I think I've done a lot of stuff about my by myself and I'm coming back home thinking, man, how much bigger could my world be if I if I was really partnering with other people and sharing that growth together? What could that look like? Well, let me tell you, I, I believe it. And uh, the and I'm speaking from some experience here in some ways, I believe that we're so conditioned a lot of times where we did not have, we believe that the people who have, they own everything. So our focus a lot of time is on a hundred percent. I want to own a hundred percent. I want to have a hundred percent control. I want to have a hundred percent of, uh, of access. I want a hundred percent. And the reality is that when you have a hundred percent control, you have a hundred percent access. You also have a hundred percent risk. <laughs> and a hundred percent of the stress. And a hundred percent of the stress. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we have to, we have, that's a conversation that we have to have and uh, about partnerships. We have to figure out who we can partnership. And I say this all the time, relationships will take you places money can't. Yeah. Partnerships will take you places that you as an individual can't go. Yeah, that's good. So I think this is a this is a, a a good part of wrapping up on just understanding that the industry is changing, the landscape is changing. Mm -hmm. Somebody moved the cheese, and the cheese has changed. Yes. So how are you? How are you thinking about your business, your career, your um, your ability to survive in this world? Are you looking at yourself in the mirror and feeling sorry for yourself? Or are you looking at yourself in the mirror saying, you know, I'm going to work a whole heck of a lot harder. I'm going to make less than I did last year. And I'm okay with it because the tide will swing again at some point. We have to have a commitment to find out what is the fundamental basis of how we connect with our customers and clients, which really means I'm adding value to someone else's life. Yeah. How can I add value to someone else's life? Now, the next question, the next conversation is, how do I, where do I get the information to become more skilled to articulate the value that I bring to someone else's life? And then the third part is, what's my commitment level, right, to bring value? What's my commitment level to find out where I can get the value? And what's my commitment level to really be engaged with the people who I believe that are important in my business to make this happen. Yeah, that's real. Good reflection times, good, good mid-year check-in. We have to be more di diligent and more vigilant on getting better. Don't wish it was easier. Yeah. Focus on getting better. And that's what we're going to have to do. Focus on getting better because it's not going to get any easier. I love that. Don't wish it was easier. Focus on getting better. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, thank you all for listening. Until next time. Yes, yes. We'll see you guys soon. Yes. All right, brother. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. The views, thoughts, and opinions of the guest represent those of the guest and not KWRI and its affiliates and should not be construed as financial, economic, legal, tax, or other advice. This podcast is provided without any warranty or guarantee of its accuracy, completeness, timeliness, or results from using the information.